All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this week's Origins Seminar. Uh, this week's speaker is Mari uh, Maria Steinruck. Uh, she is a graduate student here at LPL, and she works on 3D simulations of exoplanet atmospheres, uh, one of which she's going to be talking to us about today. So Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, today I will be talking about my most recent paper, uh, 3D simulations of photochemical hazes in the atmospheres of hot Jupiters. Um, and I first want to start off with just briefly a reminder of the big picture, which a lot of you are familiar with. Um, so these are all uh, exoplanets that have been found to date. Um, and looking at them in the mass period diagram, hot Jupiters are in the top left corner and they are uh, particularly easy to study because they have hot temperatures, um, hydrogen dominated uh, atmospheres, which gives you uh, large scale heights, very extended atmospheres that are easy to probe in transit. Um, they have short periods, which also makes observations to be able to schedule uh, more easily. They have a high transit probability. And because of all of these uh, properties, um, they are a fantastic starting point for uh, going beyond just thinking of planets as uh, points in this diagram, but actually characterizing their atmospheres in detail, which is uh, what I'm interested in. Uh, so uh, most top Jupiters that we observe uh, are transiting exoplanets. Um, and just a brief reminder of uh, what possibilities we have to study the atmospheres. The, the most classic one is, uh, is taking a transmission spectrum as the planet passes in front of the star and that probes the terminator region of the planet. And it typically probes relatively low pressures. The second uh, way to get information is uh, the secondary eclipse as the planet passes behind its star and then you can take the difference uh, to when it's in, uh, next to a star and behind the star. And that gives you a thermal emission spectrum and a reflected light spectrum. And it probes the day side. And the third possibility is um, uh, to look at the phase curve, uh, which uh, also gives it a thermal e emission and reflected light, uh, but as a function of orbital phase. So you're observing different parts of the planet throughout time. and Overall, we want to uh, ideally use all of these uh, observations to uh, characterize uh, the atmosphere as well as possible. And uh, today, a lot of my talk is actually going to focus on transit observations. So remember, we're probing the terminator here, and we tend to probe low pressures. Um, we have. Uh, quite a large set of transit observations of uh, different hot Jupiters by now. Um, and many of these transit spectra show signatures of small particles located at high altitudes. Um, one of these signatures is a strong Rayleigh scattering slopes. The second one is muted wings of the sodium and potassium lines. And the third uh, one is that the water future uh, is also muted. Uh, so there's a lower amplitude than we would expect for a clear atmosphere. And in combination, um, it's also been shown by Singh et al. Uh, 2015 that there's a clear correlation between these features, uh, which gives us confidence that it's actually really small uh, aerosols in their atmospheres and not any other hypothesis. Um, so one big question uh, that's um, uh, that's important for, for many uh, people working on Jupiter is what are these uh, aerosols made of? And there's two fundamentally different types. There are condensate clouds. This is similar to water clouds on Earth. And the general idea is uh, hot air rises, it cools down as it rises, and some species crosses the consistent curve, and uh, then it uh, condenses and rains out. For hot Jupiters, they're way too hot for water clouds uh, to exist. All the water is vaporized. Uh, but there's more uh, exotic species that we typically think of as rocks and earth, for example, silicates 
or uh, corundum or um, uh, some sulfides uh, that could form clouds. And the second uh, fundamentally different type of aerosols is photochemical hazes. We know these from a solar system, a classic example is Titan. And what happens for photochemical hazes is that uh, UV light um, um, hits the atmosphere at low pressures and then uh, it uh, splits apart uh, molecules and, and triggers a chain of reactions that can get quite complicated. But as an end result, you get uh, small uh, particles uh, for it um, that might be made of hydrocarbons or, um, or uh, some other compositions. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus on these photochemical hazes because um, there have been uh, a lot of studies by now that uh, focus on condensate clouds and how they would be distributed in hot Jupiter atmospheres, but photochemical hazes have been uh, a bit more neglected. And that's uh, the gap I was aiming to fill with this paper. Um, so up until I uh, did this work, there was no published work on uh, 3D simulations that included photochemical hazes. Uh, but why are 3D simulations so important for hot Jupiters? Uh, hot Jupiters are very close to the host stars. Uh, that's their defining feature. And because of that, uh, they are uh, in synchronous rotation because tidal forces have slowed them down. Uh, and they have a permanent uh, day side, a permanent night side, and that leads to huge uh, day-night contrasts of up to a thousand Kelvin or more. And um, here you can see a picture from a uh, 3D simulation that I ran. Um, and the substellar point um, is located at uh, zero degrees longitude in the, uh, in the center of the panel. Um, and you can say, see that there's uh, both um, very strong day-night temperature contrast, but it's also uh, a, a very distinct uh, structure. And you also get the very strong uh, atmospheric circulation with winds of uh, several kilometers per second. And uh, we need to take all of these effects into account. And with 1D uh, models, we can only do that in a very limited way. So one issue with 1D models studying photochemical hazes is uh, they typically as assume uh, a dayside average profile, which is here uh, highlighted by the arrow. Um, and that is great for uh, studying how hazes form because that's the average condition where they uh, will first form. Uh, but um, it does not give you any direct insight on what the properties should be like at the terminator, which uh, can be much cooler and where we typically observe these hazes. It also neglects horizontal mixing and vertical mixing is also uh, happening in a very simplified way. In 1D models, typically um, vertical mixing is parameterized by this uh, parameter that's called the eddy diffusion coefficient. And that is assuming that vertical mixing is a purely uh, diffusive process uh, which uh, some simulations uh, by uh, Shang and Shoman uh, 2018 have shown that that's not necessarily fulfilled in hot Jupiters. Um, plus, uh, it also uh, when in one of these simulations, you have to uh, make some guess about the strength of that eddy diffusion coefficient, and the conclusions can strongly depend on that. Um, finally, there's also this question, are haze, is haze coverage going to be homogeneous across the planet? And there's this idea that was proposed by Eliza Kempton uh, that we could tell the difference between condensate and photochemical hazes, not so much by uh, detailed spectral measurements, which have um, in, in terms of detecting spectral features, uh, but by looking at where on the planet they are uh, located. So the idea here was if we can uh, do ingress and egress spectroscopy, where in the ingress spectroscopy, uh, we would uh, 
observe the leading limb of the planet or what's called the morning terminator. And then uh, when in, during the egress of the transit, we would uh, get a spectrum of the trailing limb in transit or eating terminator. Um, then we could measure a difference between the spectrum on different parts of the terminator. And you would uh, expect condensate clouds to have a different 3D distribution than photochemical hazes. And in that paper, she used a simple toy model and the suggestion in a toy model was that condensate clouds would be located at the morning terminator, which we know from 3D simulations that it is cooler. Um, while photochemical hazes would form on the day side and then they would either be distributed uh, homogeneously um, or uh, they would uh, form on the day side uh, be transported to the evening terminator by the eastward winds. Um, and uh, then they would settle out at the night side. So either they would be homogeneous or they would be at the evening terminator, but you would not expect them at the morning terminator. But that was a very simple toy model. Um, and uh, one of the key questions that I want to examine in, in this work is, is it really as simple or, uh, um, or is it actually completely different? Um, so uh, just to summarize, one key hypothesis uh, that I want to examine is pho that photochemical hazes are more abundant at the evening terminator than at the morning terminator. Moving on to the methods, um, I'm using the MIT GCM with a double gray radiative transfer. Um, I'm assuming a relatively simple assumption for the radiative transfer because um, that allows us to test the model uh, much more detailed. Um, I'm assuming the planet properties of HD 189733b, which is both uh, one of the best studied hot Jupiters, but is also uh, one of the classic examples where you get a very uh, steep short wavelength slope, which is typically interpreted as evidence for uh, aerosols. So it's one of the more interesting properties. In addition, it is uh, very cool uh, compared to a lot of other hot Jupiters, which is also more favorable to the formation of um, photochemical hazes. Um, and then we use a passive tracer package for hazes. The key point passive uh, here means uh, that um, as of now, we're not including the feedback of the hazes on the temperature structure. Um, that's because uh, these are first simulations and it's already uh, complex to do it. And we will include uh, the radiative feedback in a later follow-up project. Um, uh, I consider seven constant particle sizes uh, between one uh, nanometer and one micrometer. And then uh, I assume for the haze source, it's the log normal and pressure, it's peaking at two microbar, uh, which is uh, roughly what we expect uh, from photochemical models. And uh, it's centered on the day side uh, with a cosine of the angle of incidence uh, dependence. And finally, we also have to make a, um, an assumption of uh, the boundary conditions uh, in the deeper atmosphere. Um, we assume that they uh, disappear at pressures that are higher than uh, 100 millibars. Um, this uh, could mimic uh, either they're thermally destroyed or um, that clouds condense upon uh, the um, hazes. So the hazes would basically act as condensation nuclei for clouds. Um, and having just a, um, um, the 100 millibar pressure uh, boundary uh, mimics this process in a very idealized way, uh, which is uh, a, a reasonable assumption for this uh, first study. And perhaps in the future, one can improve upon that. Um, moving on to the results, um, basically I found that there are two different regimes. There's uh, small particles, uh, smaller than 30 nanometers, and there's large particles. 
what's characterizing small particles is that their distributions uh, is uh, relatively uh, similar um, between different particle sizes because gravitational settling has a relatively um, small role. And here you can see a, a profile of uh, the haze difference uh, between the morning and the evening terminator. Um, and you can see that it looks uh, quite similar between the different particle sizes. And the um, interesting point here is we have more hazes at the morning terminator uh, than at the evening terminator, which is uh, the opposite of what uh, the Kempton et al. Uh, paper predicted. So what is going on here? Um, I'm showing here a, um, a horizontal slice of my model at 10 microbar. And the morning terminator is located at minus 90 uh, degrees. Uh, the substellar point is at zero degrees and the evening terminator is at 90 degrees. And you can uh, very clearly see in, in a picture just that there's more hazes on the night side and more hazes at the morning terminator. Um, why is that? There's two factors that are involved in, in that. One is uh, if you look at the vertical velocities, um, you have uh, mostly upwelling at the um, at the day side so here. Th this is um, red is all upwelling and blue is downwelling. And um, at the day side, you have upwelling that's transporting uh, air from deeper layers that's depleting in hazes uh, towards uh, uh, the upper uh, uh, pressures. And even though the hazes are forming at the day side, they then get transported to the night side. And at the night side, we have much more downwelling here and uh, here. And that tends to concentrate the uh, hazes there because the hazes form uh, at low pressures. And then whenever you have downwelling, you're going to have uh, concentrated regions of hazes. Um, the second factor is um, that the hazes get trapped in these uh, night set vortices that you can see here. Um, and they very clearly correlate with these spots of enhanced hazes. Um, so now what does it look like for large particles? Uh, there we get a very different picture. You get more hazes at the evening terminator than at the morning terminator. Um, uh, so for large particles, it is basically exactly how uh, Eliza Kempton predicted in her, in her paper. Um, and looking here at um, what's happening in 3D simulations at very low pressures, um, settling strongly uh, dominates the distribution. And so it, um, the 3D distribution roughly mirrors the uh, his production rate um, uh, because the settling is faster than horizontal transport. And then if you go uh, to somewhat higher pressures, um, the uh, settling uh, time scale and the transport time scale become comparable. And then uh, the hazes uh, get carried eastward uh, by the winds. And uh, then if you go a little bit uh, further down, you uh, you get this picture where the hazes are carried eastward by the winds and and then they're more concentrated at the morning terminator than uh, uh, pardon they're more concentrated at the evening terminator here than at the morning terminator um, now uh, we're moving on to the transit spectra um, to see, can we actually uh, determine, um, is there a chance that we could detect uh, these terminated differences? Um, so to simulate transit spectra, um, we use a 1D radiative transfer code um, that's using a detailed line by line calculation of the molecular opacities. And for the hazes, we assume uh, mean scattering and optical properties of suit. Um, 
And then finally, uh, we choose the Hayes production rate uh, such that the spectrum matches the observations between 1.1 and uh, 1.7 microns, so right in this region here, which are some of the um, highest quality observations. And uh, looking at different particle sizes, there's no particle size that matches the uh, transit uh, spectrum perfectly. Uh, but in general, um, smaller particle sizes match the spectrum better than uh, larger particle sizes. Uh, we cannot quite uh, reproduce the steep slope, and I will talk about that later. But first, we will look at uh, what the prospects for detecting terminated differences are, and we'll focus on the smaller particle sizes here. So here you can see a simulation of uh, uh, the morning and evening terminated uh, spectrum uh, separately. And you can see that the differences are very small. And that first actually surprised us because we saw that there's at least a factor of two difference in, in the abundance of the small hazes. And we would expect to see that in a transit spectrum. Um, but then thinking about it, we realized um, uh, that the, the effects of the temperature and the mass mixing ratio uh, cancel each other out. So for the small particles, we have more hazes at the morning terminator. And um, that would make the transit radius in general larger because you have more opacity. But at the same time, the morning terminator also has a cooler temperature. And um, that uh, makes, if you have if you're assuming, which we are, uh, that at um, deeper pressures, the radius is the same, uh, then that gives you a smaller radius uh, at, than at the evening terminator because of the cooler temperatures. And at the evening uh, terminator, vice versa, you have less hazes, which gives you a, should give you a smaller transit radius. But then you have a hotter temperature, which should si simply put, give you a larger uh, transit radius. So uh, to check if that was the cause, um, we um, we kept the, uh, we made a generated transit spectrum where we kept the temperature profile constant, and you can see that the uh, temperature difference between the morning and evening terminator is significantly larger that way. It's still relatively small compared to the typical error bars that we have ob observations, but there is a clear difference. So. So hazes make a difference, um, but it will be very uh, hard to quantify. Uh, so one very important part uh, that we can take away of, from that is um, if, if we're able to measure a terminated difference, so this, which uh, I think people try to propose every HSC cycle and with JWST they, they will too, um, it's going to be very tricky to interpret them uh, because at least for, for short wavelengths, the, the effects of hazes and the effect of temperature difference uh, actually counterbalance each other. And um, it would be difficult uh, to, to uh, tell these effects apart uh, later on. And um, if you're trying to if you have the observations and you're trying to sort of retrieve a uh, haze mass mixing ratio difference and a uh, temperature difference, these two would be degenerate. So that's an important conclusion. Um, while in general there are terminated differences, they would uh, they would be difficult to observe and they would be difficult to interpret. So now uh, back to the short wavelength slope. Um, as I mentioned, we cannot match the observed slope with any particle size. And uh, now that uh, is uh, an important question. Why can we not match that slope? Um, there are multiple potential explanations. One would be additional vertical mixing. And the second one would be uh, different haze optical properties. And there's two additional factors that could affect the slope, but we don't expect 
them to to be strong enough to completely resolve the discrepancy. One is uh, that the temperature profile might be different, for example, to to the haze radiative feedback, or also due to um, making more realistic assumptions in the radiative transfer. And uh, the second one is that part of the slope might be caused by star spots. But uh, in general, um, those have clearly have an effect on the slope, but we somewhat doubt that it would be large enough to uh, solve the full discrepancy. So uh, first I want to talk about the vertical mixing. Uh, so here, what we try to do is derive an effective eddy diffusion uh, coefficient from our simulations so we can directly compare to 1D models. And there are 1D models that can uh, match the slope very well. So um, our, we were asking what is different in our 3D simulations. So here you can see uh, one method that's based on the eddy tracer uh, flux. And then a second method uh, that's a fit to the analytical uh, solution. And you can see that they agree quite well with each other, except in this very top region for which this analytical solution is not constant. And there's here some region where uh, the uh, eddy trace of flux method has some problems. But the general picture is quite consistent between both of them. And here uh, is the typical assumption that uh, has been used in uh, 1D models, which is the root mean square of the vertical velocity from the GCM. And uh, you can see uh, that there's a much stronger uh, pressure dependence in uh, the vertical mixing in our simulations than in, in this uh, pink uh, dot dashed line uh, that's typically used in uh, 1D models. Um, yeah, so, um, so uh, if we have, um, so one solution would be if there's some process that gives us additional vertical mixing for whatever reason, that could dissolve, um, solve the uh, discrepancy. Um, and there are a couple of sources. One would be a uh, more realistic radiative transfer. Um, first of all, using wavelength dependent radiative transfer rather than the uh, gray model that we did because these simulations were complex to run and using the gray model gave us the opportunity to, to test the model very well. Um, that might make a difference um, in general the vertical velocities are uh, relatively similar to each other, but uh, there's some, and qualitatively you get a similar atmospheric circulation, but there are some differences that still might make a difference. And that's something we want to address in a follow-up study. And the second thing that could very drastically change the atmospheric circulation is haze radiative feedback. Um, so hazes are, um, especially the suit hazes that we assume, they uh, very strongly absorb in the optical and the short, short wavelength. So they could potentially create an atmospheric uh, inversion. And uh, that would uh, potentially significantly change the atmospheric circulation. And it might increase the strength of vertical mixing. It does not necessarily have to, is something we have to test in uh, future simulations but it could lead to a change in the right direction. The second uh, potential source of additional vertical mixing is turbulence that is not resolved by GCM. Uh, so GCMs have a relatively large uh, grid size due to computational uh, limitations. And there are also processes that are just too small to ever a model in a GCM or that are difficult to constrain. Um, that could create additional vertical mixing at smaller uh, scales that are not resolved by large scale uh, circulation. For example, it could be turbulence generated at the radiative convective boundary, or it could be wave breaking, there could be uh, magnetohydrodynamic effects, and a couple of other physical processes uh, that 
uh, are not uh, included in, in typical GCMs. So um, to at least um, get a, uh, a sense if that could be something that, that would improve uh, fit to our uh, simulations, we ran some tentative uh, simulations that, um, oh, I was not meaning to uh, animate that. So um, we ran some uh, additional simulations where we, in addition, added a, a subgrid uh, KCZ that's, um, so that's an edit diffusion uh, happening in the GCM in addition to the mixing through the atmospheric circulation. and. Um, we ran different strengths, but the strength that I'm going to show you in the next slide um, is indicated here by the uh, gray vertical line here. Um, so this is just a very simplified way of approaching this problem to see how, how would the haze distribution change in that case. And uh, the simulation um, the, that we ran here um, the short conclusions from that is the 3D distribution looks very different in that case, but at the same time, we still have very strong horizontal um, abundance uh, gradients, and we have a very distinct 3D simulations is nowhere near homogeneous. And the second uh, takeaway from that is with such uh, subgrid cases, uh, we can match uh, the slope quite well. And we still get um, terminator differences in that case that actually are uh, easier, would be easier to observe in that case than it would be in, in the case uh, of our nominal simulations. So a second, the second possibility that I mentioned that could change uh, this, the slope is the um, haze optical properties. So, uh, in our simulations, we assume that they are, are uh, similar to suits, which is what people think is the, probably the best analog for uh, um, for hazes. Uh, these are typically produced in combustion experiments, and then we have detailed measurements of optical properties for, from them. Um, however, some other modelers make the assumption of uh, titan type hazes or uh, tholins. And um, we wanted to explore this assumption because, um, uh, for example, the um, Katsumana on Katsumasa Ono's paper uh, found that he, he was able to produce a much steeper vertical slope. And that is uh, because if you compare the optical properties of both of these types, uh, the uh, Titan type hazes have uh, a very uh, steep uh, gradient from the um, from the imaginary reflective index or the absorption coefficient, uh, it, they're much more absorptive in the uh, in the UV and then in the infrared. Um, so we also uh, ran simulations um, well, transit spectra uh, with the um, solar and optical properties. And in this case, uh, we can get a significantly uh, stronger uh, slope. At the same time, the fit in the infrared gets uh, somewhat worse. And also, we need to assume a significantly higher haze production rate in that case because uh, the tholins have a uh, lower absorption coefficient in the infrared. And uh, because of that, we just need to assume that there's more hazes there. Um, so those provide a better match, not an ideal match. Um, in any case, the optical properties of real hazes are quite likely to differ from both suits and tholins. Um, it's very important to understand that nobody expects that there actually would be, um, that hazes would have the same properties as tholins that are produced from lab experiments that are simulating Titan's atmosphere, which is much, much cooler. And it's also uh, nitrogen dominated, not hydrogen dominated. But um, this gives us at least 
a somewhat of a uh, sense of how much the optical uh, properties can influence the spectrum. So to um, to uh, further improve on his optical properties, what will be needed uh, is laboratory experiments. There are multiple groups, like a group of Sarah Hurst and uh, Benjamin Fleury at GPL. Um, they both have uh, produced uh, laboratory analogs specifically for exoplanets. And um, having optical properties uh, from those experiments uh, will hopefully uh, provide better constraints uh, in in the future. Unfortunately, I know a lot of these efforts got interrupted by the pandemic, so we will probably have to wait a little bit longer until uh, we have uh, better data that we uh, can use in our models. And then finally, I also want to comment on the temperature profile. So um, there is, um, these are 1D simulations that include haze radiative feedback. And you can see here that there's quite a difference between no radiative feedback or having a radiative feedback in, uh, in the model. And that can uh, produce a hotter temperature profile, which a hotter temperature profile tends to uh, produce a steeper uh, slope at short wavelengths. And that is also expected to uh, affect the transit slope. At the same time, it is likely not enough to fully resolve the discrepancy. If you do a short, a very naive back of the envelope uh, calculation for how much you would have to change the temperature to match the slope, if it's the only thing you change is the temperature profile, you would need about um, two to three times harder profile than you can generate with uh, the um, haze rated the feedback in 1D simulations. So it, it's likely that including haze rated feedback uh, will um, help, uh, but you would need a combination of the change in vertical mixing due to haze feedback and the temperature profile to fully match the spectrum. And that's something I'm working on right now. And I hope in a few months, uh, I can give you an update on whether that improves things or not. I'm very excited about this, but uh, it, it's going to take a little bit longer until I can report on results from that. So um, this arrives uh, at the end of uh, the talk. Um, so again, uh, the key conclusions are, uh, we have a very complex 3D uh, distribution of photochemical hazes. Uh, the, uh, the small hazes are more concentrated at the morning terminator than at the evening terminator, while large hazes are uh, more abundant at the evening terminator because they settle out at the night side. The resulting difference between morning and evening terminator in the transit spectra is uh, small uh, because the effects of the temperature and the haze distribution cancel each other out. And then again, we cannot match the uh, short wavelength slope in our nominal models, but either having additional vertical mixing or uh, different haze optical properties could resolve this. And now I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, if you have questions for the speaker, you can use the raise hand feature to ask your questions live, or you can type your questions in the chat. And I see that we already have a question from Everett, so go ahead. Well, thank you for that really cool research and uh, all these uh, digging into the 3D parts that very few people venture into. Uh, I was wondering if you uh, have seen, so Ian Dobbs Dixon has a, a paper, I think from 2012, so looking at the temperature effect. So on this third bullet point, um, that the temperature effect causes a timing off, a very small, like a few seconds timing offset. And I was wondering if you think maybe that would be a way to disentangle uh, kind of the haze effects from the temperature effects where, you know, the, he, he found that like the, the leaving side has this, this, it sticks out more and basically it, it starts the transit a little er earlier um, than the, the, the night side, the, the evening terminator. Uh, so I have not read that paper with that idea in mind, but I don't think that it would necessarily help because I think the 
I think that likely um, that effect is just based on the radius being a bit larger. So it would be the same, basically the same problem because the hazes would then also make the temperature a bit, um, I mean, I mean, okay. I so the boat timing yeah. would go the so, same way too. Yeah. Okay. I that's think so. Yeah. I need to revisit the paper, but I think that that's the most likely effect is that it's the same. It's just because the radius is different. The effective radius. I see. Thank you. Uh, Chen Ling. That's very interesting work. Uh, I was never really understand why a star spot can create a steeper slope. So do you have an idea on why it is the case? Um, yes, yeah, so basically, okay, there's two, uh, in general, star spots have a different spectrum than, um, the, than the rest of the star. And then, so if there are um, there, there are two different effects. One is occulted star spots, um, which you can somewhat constrain. Um, so if you pass over a star spot during your transit, and the more difficult one is unocculted uh, star spots, because if you, from what I understand, that's more difficult because it, it, it's a bit harder to. Uh, constrained because if you pass a star spot during transit, at least you will see sort of some signal in the transit. Uh, but in general, so star spots tend to be, I think, redder than the rest of the star. And um, depending on the distribution that can give you a overall, if you, when, when you're trying to rewrite the transit model and you don't take that into account um, that can give you a different spectrum. And the main, so for specifically for HD 189, there's this McCulloch et al. 2014 paper that claims to, uh, to be able to completely um, explain the entire slope by uh, unocculted star spots that would be at high latitudes and that people did so normally, whenever people derive transit spectra, um, they try to correct for star spots. But that paper argued that um, if these star spots are all concentrated at high latitudes, um, and uh, this way, uh, and they would form a somewhat continuous band, that way you cannot directly observe them during rotational modulation. In that case, because the the um, because this, the star spots basically have a different spectrum than the rest of the star, and then you're passing during the transit, the um, you're occulting a, a region of the planet of the star that has a different spectrum than the average spectrum you're observing. So they claim to completely explain the entire spectral slope. So most people I've talked to think that their um, that their uh, assumptions are like more on the extreme end and then it's unlikely that you can ex um, explain the entire slope as much as they say in their paper. But I'm also not sure um, how much of it can be explained or or not because different people seem to have different opinions. And if somebody has a much better understanding uh, of what the, how this and uh, the understanding of star spots and their effect on transit has evolved in, in like the past seven years since this paper come out, I, I would be happy if you could talk to me or chime in here. Maria, did you feel that there's uh... In the single paper, original paper that published the HD one in nine data, there were also measurements of monitoring of, of the star by Gregory Henry. And there's also a more recent paper, I think Frederick found also 
went back to the drawing of how much uh, the slope would change if you had star spots covering about 4% of the star. Actually, I don't know if you published that or not, but there were some estimates in the thing at all that you could start with. Maybe they know more about what. What's what's the second paper that I mentioned? The more recent. Can you type that in the chat, perhaps? Yeah, it was in that paper where he had he was estimating different sizes of the particles and some settling of the larger ones to try to explain the slope, different slope. Um, so there's there, there's things we can check. Because that star has been, it's always monitored by Greg Henry every year. So you have an idea of, of the activity uh, and how much you can, uh, some kind of a limit to how many spots there could be. It's never 100% certain because you don't have an absolute scale. You have variation. Uh, but uh, you can make some estimates. So I remember that Frederick was very worried when that paper came out. He had done some estimates before, but then he exaggerated them and he concluded that, like what you're saying, that you would need too much, too many star spots to be able to explain the whole uh, slope out because of the star spots, all of those ones. So, it may be an effect that you can add, but it's not going to explain it all out. Thank you. Yeah, that confirms overall my impression, but thank you. That was very helpful detail. <laughs> all right. Uh, do we have any additional questions for Maria? I do, Maria. So the, the Hayes model, you start with the distribution of Hayes produced by potential actual photochemistry in the paper or just a day side production with some arbitrary spatial function? So it's somewhere in between. So it's informed by uh, by photochemical models that Panayotis Lavas run. Uh, but uh, those photochemical models can also only give us an constraint by about two orders of magnitude or so, um, because we don't know uh, how efficiently the photochemical products that we think are haze precursors are actually turned into hazes. Uh, so estimates, a typical estimate is that 1% of those, but it might as well be 10% or 0.1%. Uh, so because of that, um, we ran the simulations with uh, one assumed rate and then afterwards, we um, uh, because there are passive traces, we can always uh, just afterwards uh, multiply it by a factor if we want the Hayes uh, production rate to change. And um, so afterwards, we looked at which Hayes production rate would best uh, reproduce this transit spectrum. And uh, that's the plot, the Hayes assumption rates uh, that, uh, that we uh, use in the transit plots that I showed you. But then those are within about that, um, they, they are within reasonable, um, the reasonable range that we get from the photochem mode. So, uh, Hayes, does it make sense? Yeah. Within about a factor of 10 or within a smaller factor? It's... <sighs> It's without, so if I remember correctly, uh, the, the initial uh, quantity that we input in the model was more on the, was very much towards the upper side, um, the upper haze production rate that you would uh, use. And then the one that, that we use for transit, it's within, it's a factor of 50 less but that's within like roughly, so it's the range, we can constrain it by about two orders of magnitude and the original uh, value we put into our simulations is, is very definitely on the upper end. 
and the one that we match the trans mesh with is more towards the lower end, but still both within the reasonable range we would expect. Okay, I have one more question. You talk about suits and combustion products. So these combustion products are not dominated, the source for combustion is not dominated by methane or by some kind of CO or CO2 in terms of the carbon. But what are the suits? So the, you mean the chemical composition of the suits? Yes. So it's mostly just carbon from what I understand. Hydrocarbon. So carbon. Yes. Okay. Yes. So when we look at the experiments from Sarah Hurst's group, they find that uh, in a lot of her experiments for exoplanets, they were actually more oxygen dominated, but we don't currently have any lab analogs that we have optical properties uh, that have incorporated as much oxygen as some of the ones in uh, in her lab experiments. So we're very, very much waiting for uh, hearing back more from that. But unfortunately, I know the pandemic disrupted the, the lab measurements quite a lot. All right. Um... I'm not seeing any final questions. So in that case, thank you so much, Maria, for talking to us today. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, please remember that if you're outside Arizona next week, talk's probably going to be one hour later. Um, but otherwise, I invite everyone to unmute and uh, thank Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you.